So welcome to our final morning of the Horizons Conference. My name is Joanna Ashworth and I'm part of the team from Siri that has been hosting you this, um, these last four days. And it's so exciting to be at this stage in the conference and to see all your shining faces and all, actually to feel like more energized at this point than I think that we were at the beginning. So I think that's a really good sign. Um, so uh, as I said, I'm a research associate with Siri and part of the organizing committee. And I'm also very honored to welcome to the stage Simpulian uh, Stuart Gonzalez, who is a two-spirited elder and knowledge keeper of Squamish protocols. Uh, Simpulian, thank you for being with us today. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Uh, I'm Simpleon. My ancestor name is Simpleon. Can everyone say simple? Simple. Yon. Yon. That's me. <laughs> Simpleon was my great great grandfather. He was my sepiuk. He was a Shwa'umtin. He was an Indian doctor or medicine man for the Squamish people. I was bestowed this beautiful and honorable ancestral name from my late father 43 years ago when I was initiated in our longhouse where we perform our traditional and winter spiritual dancing. Um, I am proud to say I'm two-spirited, but I do have beautiful children. I have grandchildren and great-grandchildren. How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm so grateful to be in our territory. I can say our territory because uh, this is the, we call it a shared territory, but Skopmish had a village just north of here called Skamkamalai. And what does that mean? That means it was a place of many maple trees. The maple trees were bigger than the building we're in today. And can you imagine, and you know, we talk about evolution. You know, uh, the unfortunate thing about evolution is that we see the destruction of Mother Earth. And uh, when I was a boy growing up over in Tla'an, over in North Vancouver, uh, the tide would ebb and it was 30 feet between North Vancouver and Vancouver. I know it was very amazing. So I'm gonna offer a traditional uh, Squamish song I will speak in Skokmish Nation, my father's language. I can speak in my mother's language of Hunknitman, but primarily I've been speaking Skokmish for the majority of my life. So I'm honored and I understand you've had some really uh, impactful and uh, in-depth conversations. And uh, I will bring a critical lens to uh, everything that you've been doing for the past few days. So I'm going to offer a song called Inchopmot Slolem. Talks about unity, and I'll step back from the mic because uh, I I transform when I sing traditional songs. So. Oh. 
OCM Chin Kwan Man Chomi Yap CM CM to Sequate Sos Chit CM to Seo Kokwachit Kwan Man Tomi CM to Quatch No Me Yap CM to Clackwachit Nat to Kam Kamalai Ochumeo An Simple Yan Snatchin Class An Ochumeo CM Squalo and Sequate Sos Masquim Selewitus Kohop Mistal Mokchit Kwan Man Tomi CM CM to Sequate Sos Koka Insult a Hat Hat Sit Out to CM Talk, talk, no, I see him. Call him and tell me, see him. First of all, I'm very grateful to see each and every one of you, our respected elders and matriarchs, thanking you for honoring the Musqueam, the Selewatuk, and the Skokomish. We are grateful to see you, and we're honored that you arrived safely here in the village of Kam Kamalai. Again, my ancestral name is Simpoyan. I come from a village called Slaan, known today as Mission Indian Reserve. My ancestry is Musqueam Squamish, and on behalf of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish, we are grateful. For those who wonder, where does the last name Gonzalez comes from? <laughs> My great-grandfather was a Mapuche Indian. He traveled here on a cargo vessel that was sinking in Aksim, known today as the Hau Sound. And him, along with other sailors, jumped ship they swam ashore. He met my great grandmother, who was Emma Chatato. Her longhouse was over here at Papiak, known today as Brockton Point. They didn't understand each other's languages, but they fell in love, and history has made it fell. <laughs> so I am grateful. My ancestry comes from Maui in Chile, again, medicine people. And my great grandfather married my great grandmother, who was a medicine woman. And that just shows the, the strength of who we are as human beings. Again, encouraging you as an Indian day school and residential school survivor, we really need to create change. And no one else can create those changes unless we have each and every one of you to come in our canoe and paddle with us. You know, the greatest thing that we can learn from our history is that we need to do better. We still have wi ab indigenous and Aboriginal women and girls that are going missing. We do have uh, our indigenous children. 75% of our children are apprehended and in care. Again, we need to create those policy changes. How can we do that? We need people like you to create those changes. Again, I, I, I advised you earlier, I will come with a critical lens. 
being an uh, Indian Day School and Residential School survivor, there's still lots of healing to do, not only for myself, but others across Canada. And, you know, when I traveled to Rome, I had an opportunity to speak with the Pope. And that brought my healing journey to a new level because, you know, I carried a message from my elders that our elders weren't looking for an apology, our elders were looking for acknowledgement for the Catholic Church's role in residential schools, in Indian day schools, and then there were the survivors of the 60s group. Again, we need to heal, and we can't, do, we can't heal by ourselves. We need each and every one of you to join together and to walk with us. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Stuart, good name, Stuart, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna, thank you. Uh, uh, namaste, uh, mucho gracias. Danke, well, danke schön, gambe, doje, sheshe, merci, hi hi, machi show, miigwech, and ching kwamantomi. Those are all, well, some of the languages I know, and I, now I'm showing off. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Simpoyan, for encouraging us, for inspiring us to do better. And we appreciate your, your message and thank you for sharing your story. So it is my great pleasure now to turn to the Methodology Marathon. I'm sure you've been waiting all week for this. Um, I had the pleasure of reading all the submissions that came through uh, with, the, with the team. And, um, you know, there was just so many amazing methodologies presented in the work that you're doing um, that support the work of community engaged research and some of these creative methods we've all you've been exposed to you've been in the uh, the plenary sessions you've been to uh, some of the breakout groups so you know that that um, many of the, the those of you who are doing uh, community engaged research are using really creative means to do so but this morning we're going to give you a potent dose of innovation and highly creative highly collaborative research methods to give you something to ponder as you uh, leave uh, after today. And we borrowed from the Pecha Kucha format, which is 20 slides in 20 seconds, and these move uh, automatically, uh, so they create, whether you like it or not, a very fast-paced, yet we hope meaningful uh, experience. So I'm gonna start this uh, session. You can see um, we've got some wonderful speakers lined up. Unfortunately, our first speaker, Kaylee Rayburn, who's the director of Health Design Lab at Emily Carr University, and her presentation on trauma-informed design, she's not able to be with us, but she was able to record her presentation. So we'll start with that and uh, let it roll so you get to see the format and um, hope you enjoy it. So we'll just, we'll run these back to back and then we'll have a chance to have a stretch and a, and a short break if you want to chat with the, the presenters. So let's hear this first present presentation. Hi everybody, my name is Kaylee Raber and I'm the director of the Health Design Lab at Emily Carr. Today I'll be sharing reflections on implementing trauma-informed practices in participatory design contexts. These insights are gained from our experiences bringing together students and people with lived experience before, during, and after the facilitation of participatory design activities. At the lab, we use participatory design methods to catalyze, support, and amplify initiatives that address complex health challenges. And as designers, we never work alone. We're a dynamic team that works um, to meet our project and research needs, um, collaboratively working with partners and the communities they serve. Participatory design is a practice and a process that includes people who will be impacted by a design outcome in the process. And that process includes the use of creative and participatory methods to facilitate dialogue, ideation, prototyping, testing, and the development of potential outcomes. Participatory design research practices, such as interviews, journey mapping, co-design workshops, are able to engage people in exciting and accessible ways that can uncover important knowledge and data for researchers. However, if not set up with care, they have the potential to bring up painful emotions and traumatic memories for participants. Over the past year, we've spent a lot of time reflecting on the participatory design work that our lab is involved in and exploring how we can make our projects more trauma-informed and trauma-responsive. 
both for the participants we work with and our team of designers. And so today I'll quickly share with you some of our lessons learned. Trauma-informed work begins with understanding what trauma is, where it comes from, and how it impacts relationships and interactions between people. Pat Ogden describes trauma as any experience that is stressful enough to leave us feeling helpless, frightened, overwhelmed, or profoundly unsafe. And there are many different types of trauma. <clears throat> trauma-informed practice is aware of, anticipates, and responds to the impacts of trauma when working with participants, creating situations that minimize potential for re-traumatization. Trauma-informed practices have been a part of the health research context for quite some time, but are newer in design. Trauma-informed design is an emerging topic within the field of design and stems from other trauma-informed approaches to community-oriented research. The concept has gained traction in recent years through the work of Rachel Dykus, Tad Hirsch, and others who have made links between the work designers do with facilitating co-design sessions and the effects of psychotherapy or social work environments. <clears throat> To be effective, trauma-informed design practices must take place through the entire design process, not just during sort of live engagements. It starts um, before participants come into the room. It includes having a defined purpose, making sure your team is the right fit, and understanding who's going to benefit from your work. Here are some examples of the preparation that goes into running a workshop or an engagement event, ensuring we have the right people in the room to facilitate and support participants, practicing ahead of time, and thoughtful attention to the tools we'll be using and how we can support engagement, self-expression for participants is really key. Ensuring the right people are on the team and building relationships with communities and people you're working with is critical to any community-based work. This is a framework from Kellyanne McCurcher's book, Beyond Sticky Notes, which shows the value of bringing together people with lived experience, with professionals and provocateurs or designers who can act as more neutral mediators, helping to balance power dynamics. Most direct interaction between designers and participants happens in the middle of a project when workshops and engagement take place. While it's not the only place to focus on trauma-informed design, it's really important to be mindful of the care of everyone involved, participants and designers or researchers. Careful selection of a location or where to gather is one consideration. For a project that involved participants from Indigenous communities and healthcare students, we held our workshop at the local Indigenous Friendship Center, prioritizing the comfort of people with historically less power and whose safety requires more attention. We also used Indigenous-led methods. Connecting with participants virtually provides the benefit of a comfortable and familiar place, but can also make it difficult to observe participants and re help reach out for support. So with virtual and in-person work, consider bringing people with like experiences together to create a more supportive and meaningful environment rather than meeting participants individually. During project engagement, it's also important to consider how co-designers and participants can help lead and shape sessions, how you can use creative methods to support self-expression and level power dynamics, and how you can build in warm-up activities and closing reflections. Trauma-informed work continues after workshops and live activities have taken place. Participants should still be kept informed, if not involved, in terms of how their contributions are being incorporated into outcomes. Designers should reflect on the work that has taken place, scheduling time to debrief and unpack what was heard, and how it also impacted designers and researchers to hear that. And these photos are a couple of examples of care packages that were sent to participants after core project activities were completed to thank them for their contributions and to help provide value for them beyond sort of our data collection phase. Here are some closing thoughts. To be trauma-informed within participatory design research, it's important to recognize power and work to level imbalances, anticipate and address potential triggers in your activities and environments, and form good relationships and build trust with your partners. Also actively listen to your co-designers and let them shape the direction of the project so that it feels meaningful and safe. Tailor co-design methods and environments to your specific context and have a plan for support that goes beyond your role, particularly in the case of designers when you're not really trained to provide appropriate support. Thank you so much for listening and uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person. Given the very short nature of this talk, 
I just want to conclude by simply directing your attention to more information about our work. And I'll also add that I shared in the in the app that we're also hiring and looking for a research coordinator at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. Boy, she really came through for us in spite of her not feeling that well. Um, so, great. Uh, now we, I want to introduce you to Callista Otoni. She's a PhD candidate in interdisciplinary studies at U University of British Columbia, and she'll present on the methods she's used for her study on loneliness and social connection in older adults. And I'm going to turn this one on. <coughs> Can folks hear me okay? Yeah. How are you? <laughs> I find that asking that question since the pandemic began can be quite loaded. We've all had our lives completely disruptive and maybe you, like me, have family and friends that you haven't been able to see and you miss them. Loneliness in cities was on the rise prior to the pandemic and the obvious concern is that physical distancing during the pandemic will make this worse. Older people in particular face health, mobility, and technology challenges that may make it difficult to stay connected during this time. Even prior to the pandemic, one in four older adults were lonely, and simply stated, loneliness is bad for your health. But I'm not here today just to tell you doom and gloom research stats. My doctoral research focuses on the loneliness and social connectedness experience of older adults. Who, um, social connectedness protects against loneliness, makes us happier, healthier, live longer. And I really wanted to give people the opportunity to talk about the positive things that can happen during challenging times. I wanted to see if we could learn from what's working instead of just identify all the problems. And I was totally blown away with participant stories of um, friendships that happened during the pandemic. But before I go more on that, let me take a step back and tell you how my doctoral research project came about in a relatively short time span. In March 2020, uh, right after BC declared a state of emergency, I connected with staff at the West End Seniors Network. So Weston and I had worked together on various community-based research projects over the last seven years. Pictured here is Barclay Manor, the home of the organization in the heart of the West End on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. The West End is unique as despite its picturesque backdrop, people that live there have lower income than Vancouver average, are more likely to rent, and older people in particular are twice as likely to live alone. When I met with Wes N over Zoom, I think maybe my first Zoom in meeting in the pandemic, we recognized there was so much information swirling around in the media, but we really knew little about what was happening in the day-to-day -day lives of older people who lived outside of long-term care. So we took a deep breath to ground ourselves and crafted my doctoral research project. I set out to listen and learn from older adults directly. So to do just that during lockdown, I interviewed 31 older adults over both telephone and Zoom to make, the, um, to make the medium accessible. And nine of them took photographs to provide a deeper perspective into their daily lives. So here are their words in their photographs. 90% of the people I talked to live in small apartments and the large majority lived alone. So they offer a particular ex uh, perspective of pandemic living. Um, their experience together show how three aspects of the neighborhood environment mattered for their social connectedness and well-being. The first was neighbors. Josephine said, I realized how much I built a community in my building. I had people that I could rely on. And if I knew if I needed anything, they were just a phone call away. So people repurposed rooftops and stairwells to connect at a safe distance. The second was access to green spaces. Marilyn explained, this was my first walk out after we were locked down, early morning and not too many people. This wonderful scene set the stage for me to relax and feel I would be okay. The natural world will sustain my spirit. With the shutdown of indoor 
organized activities, participants expressed that the natural environment and the ability to be able to walk to get to green spaces was vital for them to connect with a few trusted neighbors or walk alone to, to feel okay during this pandemic lockdown. The third aspect was neighborhood-based volunteer organizations. Their physical places, spaces closed, but many quickly pivoted to provide telephone outreach. Some of my participants received those calls and on the flip side, they served as peer support workers and connected with our eldest elders in long-term care. So they also experienced challenges. This photo titled Yearning to Escape speaks volumes. Nancy lives in co-op housing and she felt constrained by the darkness and dampness of her unit. She raised such important questions about what's the difference between a house and a place that feels like home. Larry created this image and said, you get an overloaded with the news that inevitably shows a death total. As a senior, there's almost an unearthly feeling to this time period we are going through sort of a bizarre copy of a medieval time during the Black Death or some other era. Despite these negatives, my research challenges the mainstream media idea of older adults as simply sad and vulnerable. Yes, they were isolated, but they showed tremendous agency to adapt their daily lives and connect with others. Although many had fixed limited income, they recognized that housing stability was so key to make them feel okay. So where do we go from here? My doctoral research is a work in progress. I just collected follow, two year follow up data with some of my participants and I'm strategizing with community organizations about how my evidence can form a brick in the road towards greater action on a national policy level to mitigate loneliness. And we also know that so many solutions reside in community. So that's why in the fall I plan to take photographs and participant voices through video back to the community and hold space for a discussion about what policies, programs, and shifts in perspective we can have. Um, so I will leave you with this, with what I've learned, is that if you're feeling like you're struggling to regain social connections right now, you're not alone. And also that pausing to say hi to that person in your neighborhood can have a profound difference on both of your days. So thank you. Wow, he can say a lot in a very short time. Thank you so much, Callista. And I'd like to invite Farnes Rika Jarwin, uh, a master's student in gerontology from Simon Fraser University, who will share her work on applying co-design as a method of community engaged research for de developing public spaces. So Farnes, uh, Hello, can you hear me well? This is not my Hello everyone, my name is Farnaz Rikhagaran, a master's student at the Gerontology Department of Simon Fraser University, and I am very honored to present for you today. Today I'm gonna talk about applying co-design as a method of community engaged research for developing urban public spaces. And this is based on my research during my previous master's degree in urban design. After the failure of modern architecture and urban design, the participatory approaches were brought up in the debate of urban planning. And as you can see in the Arnish Stan's letter of citizen engagement, all these approaches want to uh, empower citizens and engage them in the uh, development of cities. To introduce you to the approach of co-design, I should talk about some of its key concepts. One of them is creativity. There are two general approaches to our creativity. One says that creativity is the characteristics of individuals, and uh, then social scientists came and said that there is another term, collective uh, creativity. Uh, another key concept here is co-creation, which is about uh, active collaborations between designers and non-designers. And it's all about idea exchange between experts and non-experts, or professionals and ordinary people. 
And the last key uh, concept here is end user, who are, in this case, citizens that are the final stakeholders of whatever we do in the city. And we want them to be co-designers with us in the all steps of the co-design process. And this photo shows how our point of view toward them have changed over time. So we have three key concepts in the approach of co-design, social creativity, which is about the knowledge people uh, acquire based on their everyday experiences, co-creation or active collaboration, and end users who are citizens here. Uh, to, conduct, uh, to conduct urban co-design research, we need a simplified design-based language to facilitate the communication between designers and non-designers. In these triangles, we want to go down, move from what people say to what they know, dream, and feel with the aid of generative uh, sessions. Uh, our case study was Shamsabad neighborhood, which is a residential neighborhood in the Isfahan city in Iran. Why this neighborhood? Because uh, conducting participatory urban design needs building trust. And we ha uh, I had some initial contacts in this neighborhood. We aim to co-develop a livable public space in this neighborhood. This is the process we took, includes identifying needs, visioning, modeling, implementing and knowledge mobilization. And uh, for the three steps in the middle, we held co-design generative workshops and we used brainstorming and prototyping as our methods. In our um, generative co-design workshops, we had three sessions, visioning, uh, prioritizing needs, and uh, co-creating the livable space. We had three workshops and each of them we had six residents and you can see some of the photos of the land we wanted to develop. In the visioning step, we ask the participants how they imagine this uh, space after it is developed. And based on that, we develop this vision statement. They want place for relaxing, walking, enjoying, green space. Um, they want opportunities for works, uh, for some jobs in the buildings we want to develop, and some event spaces. Uh, in the previous steps, we developed, uh, we actually identified some needs. So we gave them a list of needs and asked them to somehow prioritize it. They wanted providing employment opportunities, providing green space, even a space, and developing some cultural and recreational spaces and buildings. In the co-creating uh, steps, which is the key step here, uh, we provided a list of questions based on the characteristics of livable spaces, which includes accessibility, comfort, inclusivity, physical attraction, and safety and um, to, to facilitate the idea generation. And because it is very difficult for non-designers to design on a bare land, we gave them some initial sketches and uh, by asking those questions, we asked them to add some items into it, remove them and change them to uh, come up with a design for this space. And to enable them to see uh, what they are developing in a three-dimensional format, we use a platform called Ecograms. And in the right side, you can see some of the samples we developed in these uh, generative sessions. It was really helpful in idea generation and uh, simulating their creativity. Then we conducted a qualitative content analysis. We developed codes, sub-themes, and themes. Uh, and used, uh, actually these themes were our um, design principles uh, for developing this uh, space. And here you can see the proposed design. Actually, there was a mosque in the corner of this land, and it was very important to the residents of this neighborhood. So we proposed to expand it, and we considered some buildings in the left side and dedicated the remaining space to the green space, places for events and gatherings. And here you can see some of the photos of the place we developed. We considered a um, specific entrance to the place because Residents ask us, we develop some areas for seating on the ground because it is very common in my culture. People like to seat on the ground. And to tell you about the lesson we learned, I should say that it was a learning opportunity both for us as designers and for the people. 
And uh, I should point out to the important role of this three-dimensional visual tool we use, how important it was for idea generation and facilitating the idea exchange and conversation. And about the challenges, I should uh, point out to COVID, of course. And after that, the uh, lack of trust between citizen, citizens to the local government and university, and uh, lack of uh, familiarity with community-engaged research in a developing country such as Iran. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Farnes. Okay, so coming up now, we have Heidi Smith from Addictive Designs. And she's here. Oh, and, oh, you <laughs> and you're going to stand here. Okay. Yes. And also uh, Nance Cunningham, and who is doing her PhD in experiential experimental medicine at the University of British Columbia, and they will share their work on the collaborative creation of a logo for untold stories of true strength. And that is a great title. And I will get your slides up right now. Okay, ready to go? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Nancy Cunningham. I'm a PhD candidate in, uh, at the University of British Columbia, and I study access to care for hepatitis C. My name is Heidi Smith, and I'm, I have a studio, Addictive Designs. I'm here today to show you what the benefits of a beautiful logo will do for your project. Not like these logos here, using too many horrible fonts, too crowded, not balanced, bright mixed match colors, scattered, free junk clip art. These examples aren't even the worst that I've seen. <laughs> oh dear, these ones are remembered for all the wrong reasons. Can you say phallic? These are just a few reasons why we must hire a professional like myself. You definitely don't want to end up with a logo like one of these. <laughs> now proceeding forward to some of the good stuff. <laughs> Great logos. The goal being to convey the messages, ideas, and values in the simplest form possible. Using negative space, the right blend of colors to communicate the messages, clean, bold fonts, lots of room to breathe, take in each logo. These logos are great. And here we have some logos that I designed, scalable, practical, transferable, using clean lines, well-chosen colors, negative space, beautiful, bold fonts. All of these are the best expressing the spirit and the meaning of your brand. These are three of my favorites in the same category close to ours that we will be showing you. This project is about hepatitis C. And hep C is so dangerous that it's been slated for elimination. And even though treatment in British Columbia is free, it turns out that many people who've been diagnosed with hepatitis C, in fact, do not take up the treatment. So this project is all about finding out why. So we went to the community, we talked to patients, we talked to people who were at risk, and we asked them about their experiences in the healthcare system. We then took all that wisdom, we packaged it up in forms that are accessible and understandable to doctors, and we took it back to the healthcare system. I will then consult and take the knowledge and perspectives, different wisdom and feedback, then straighten it out, design, create, revise, launch, and hopefully train into a beautiful revised concept. These steps are tedious, but worth every hour that goes into them. It's important if you're working with a designer in your project to create a logo or to create any other materials that you dedicate time to that. The designer needs to spend time with your team to understand not only the overview of the project, but also how the team sees it, what the history is, where they, what their vision of it is for the future. It's not as simple as it seems. My job is to take everything you project at me, research the theme and mission, of the project and then I make it simple, impactful, and beautiful using strategic, simple colors, clean designs till everyone on the project is happy with these results. I will then consult and take the knowledge and the wisdom, then straighten it out, create, revise, launch, and hopefully train into a beautiful concept. These steps are tedious, but worth every hour that goes into them. And 
and so that's what happened. When Heidi came and spent time with our team, we told her about the way that we saw the project going, she got to know all of us, and that is what let her then create a really great logo that really expressed the project. It was flexible and beautiful. I looked at many different health logos because I wanted to fit into the same category with the same look and feel. I noticed strong color usage and representation happening throughout. I also noted different common elements, including such things as ribbons, slogans, monthly campaigns, and awareness as a whole. Many well-established health logos are associated with the same assets, colors, ribbons, symbolism, they use the principles of great logos, simplicity, striking, timeless, versatile, appropriate and memorable. We must aim high and, say, and hit the same target as ours. I then researched many different Hep C campaigns and no Hep came out on top. You see, they, they use the lime green as their main color and they, and they have applied all the different principles such as the simpleness, striking, unified, distinctive, and timeless, as shown here. The Untold Stories of Two Strength Project is about bringing the ideas and the experiences of hep C affected communities to doctors. It should link in with existing viral hepatitis brands that doctors will recognize. My concept now goes to the drawing board and the process begins. This project is about taking the images of stereotype people and presenting them back to doctors in full color. So first Heidi thought about a butterfly with half of it black and white and half of it in full color. But we felt this didn't really express the people who were involved in the project, so she kept evolving the design. Voila, we nailed our concept. Bringing in the lime green the, for viral hepatitis, strong lines simplify, simplified with the butterfly clean fonts that all play the project title extremely well. We have our logo for untold stories of true strength. Our logo has taken flight here today for the world to see. Everyone talks about the untold stories that silence creeps, yet nobody talks about the hidden truth between silence that we speak. It has been my mission to make my work intertwined through endless passion projects for myself and by using my own voice for the voiceless. I definitely relate to a lot of these projects given to me. If you're interested in the logo or a project, please get in touch with myself or Nancy. We would love to hear from you. We love the logo and we love the project. So yes, please come and say hello. Oh, that was just wonderful. Thank you so much. And our next presentation, I'm really excited to introduce you to Amanda Wager. She's Canada Research Chair in Community Engaged Research at Vancouver Island University. And with her, Noreen McHale, a First Nations high school teacher is working at a school near Ladysmith and their project is on youth, culture and intergenerational uh, relationships. I will, do you want the mics? You're using the mic. Okay, you take yeah. it. <laughs> okay. I'll try. This. Okay, so let me know. Are you ready to go? Hello, everybody. Okay, let's let her run. Okay, hi, Chica, CM, CAU, Mulch, Mistimuch, Muskiam, Squamish, Selwatu, Selwatu. My name is Amanda Wager. Um, I'm of Jewish Ashkenazi descent. I was born in Los Angeles, where my mother is from, and I grew up in Amsterdam, where my father is from. And hello, I'm Noreen McHale. My mother is Rose Boucher. My father is Dwayne Loitz. I'm from the Dene Cree Metis community of Fort Mackay in Northern Alberta, the Treaty 8 territory. Presently, I'm working at Saminas Community School outside Ladysmith. And I did my Masters of Educational Leadership at VIU. At VIU, we have the ARC. It's a Center for Art, Research, and Community, which came out of the Canada Research Chair Program. And we worked with the Sawak Learning Center. Sawak is an Nichalna term uh, principle that means everything is one. The full phrase is he shook ish Sawak. Um, we are connected with everything. 
That was the late Elder Sally Williams. Uh, her family gave us permissions to be able to share that with you today. She started this project every week. We had a sharing circle, and she started by sharing this prayer. Um, the project is Youth Language Warriors, where we had um, seven to 10 youth uh, as youth participatory action researchers. Um, the elder Sally was zoomed in. We had two visiting artists, and we had three um, elders in training. Well, two elders in training, one who spoke Holkaminam, another one who spoke New Chalneth, and the Kwakwaka'wakw'a elder from Sal Elder Sally, and many youth researchers between the ages of 16 to 18. And here is one of our cultural leaders, Greg Charlson. He referred to himself as a uh, elder in training. He would share his Nichelna teachings from Heshkwit and Ahauzit. And his enthusiasm helped set our tone for our learning environment and ensuring we were going in a good way. Thank you, Greg Charlson. <laughs> uh, we had two visiting artists, Amanda Strong and Bracken. Um, they were zoomed in from the Sunshine Coast. Uh, they do awesome media claymation, and they taught the young people different media every week for the six months of the project. They did procreate, they taught procreate in, sh in shop and stop motion, and had one-on-one -on -one talks with each of the youth. So this was kind of our YPAR, Youth Participatory, Participatory Action Research um, design. The youth uh, looked for topics that they wanted to, to study and ask questions. Then they created a research question. Then they went off and uh, did a lot of research themselves and then storyboarded it and then met with Amanda and Bracken and, and created this media piece that was a public media piece to disseminate their findings. And one of our first groups began the research with this question, showing us that learning must have connections. Relationships, friendships, and love creates a deeper understanding for all of us. The first group of um, young people here, they um, did, a, uh, their research question was about the salmon. It was actually um, a son of the elder Greg, and he was a fisherman, Greg, so he, he mentored them through the way of this project. They were super excited. They got done first, they did claymation, they came in so excited, so here it is. <laughs> never put so much effort into anything before. It demonstrates that our learnings develop and appreciate the research process. They took their time, they were thoughtful, and as the learners developed their process, the topics became tougher, the ideas became stronger, their resolution in the research became decisive. A small warning for the next few uh, slides, they may be triggering for some people, as you can see here, we're getting more and more powerful images and messages. Also, these are just snippets. Um, this last uh, group, um, this young lady and young man um, also did their project about the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, they started with a, a drawing that was really powerful and they had this vision, this performance vision that was different than all the other projects. And this, the young lady organized it and led all of her classmates into creating it. So something that was interesting in the translation of language is that there weren't translations for a lot of these things, especially the traumatic events. The elders said, you know, we, d we can't translate missing and murdered indigenous women and girls because that didn't happen. And so that was really powerful in our sharing circle to, like, for the youth and for the elders and for the, the 
teachers to talk about and how, how much that impacted us. And as a whole, we learned that the process is essential. An unfinished piece holds learning, perspective, reflection, and value, just as this artwork here does for the learner who created it. So from the learners themselves, they drew this and said, hi, Sepka. Thank you to all. Thank you to the learners. And we thank the Vancouver Foundation, the Art Starts program, and the Social Science and Research Humanities. If you want to talk more about it, that's how you reach us. <laughs> Great, that was wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have one more session, and they just keep coming, but as you can see, the, the short format really allows you to be intensely engaged throughout. So uh, Jenna, I'm gonna invite you to come up. Uh, Jenna um, Aug Aug is, um, uh, has a, s a presentation on street skaters in public spaces, and her work is based on research she did in her Master's of Urban Studies at Simon Fraser University. So thank you, and I will get you started. In 2004, the first ever street style skate park was designed and constructed in Vancouver. After decades of exclusion from public space, skateboarders finally had a mecca in their city. It also ended up attracting skaters all over the world. Now what's special about the downtown skate plaza is it acts as a tribute to spaces in the city that skaters are once excluded from. It meets the needs of a specific group of people using information directly from them. The plaza is a symbol of a people's determination to occupy space they were once excluded from. To have a home in the city meant to represent them is a statement of urban legitimization. The plaza is like a community center. They can belong there without being hassled by authorities. They can feel unwanted unwanted in other parts of the city, but there they are safe. And as we discuss buzz concepts like exclusive planning, inclusive planning, a city for all, we have to focus on what truly inclusive planning really means. How do we do this, build cities for all people? Skaters represent a lot of folks on the fringes of society, ushered out of spaces that don't consider them. The images in this chat today are all submitted by participants in my study. I used photo voice as a methodology to allow participants to lead and shape the research question and, and eventually end up at deep research findings. But we can't possibly include everyone in every study, every engagement process, every survey. So which public space and for whom? Street style skaters engage in something I call strategic occupancy. Their movement in the city is shaped based on two main principles. One, how they enjoy infrastructure, and two, how not to get jailed, kicked out, fined, and injured. So public space in this way represents a lot of the things that we discussed today in planning. It aligns perfectly a space for people to express themselves, enjoy, connect with one another, and they fought for this. They advocated for themselves for a piece of public space just for them through contest, protest, and refusal. A refusal to leave and hold, physical, their, their, hold their physical bodies in space over time ended up in an urban inclusion that we benefit from, even if you don't like the sound of four wheels on pavement. They contribute to the kaleidoscope that contributes to urban vibrancy that we all enjoy. And so I wanna talk today about how we can use things like photo voice to capture perspectives and contribute to an urban realm. Allowing participants to lead research can end up in conversational intimacy a connection that empowers the inquiry. Because the participants feel in control of their involvement. They share their personal stories, 
using photos and quotes. And then I paired this with how we can address massive concepts about urban space politics and use it in planning today. We all have relationships with our city, but establishing exactly what that urban intimacy is and illuminating it through deeply personal stories and then linking it with a model such as I did, like the person place process connection, can help us understand how to create truly inclusive space. There's a power in hearing someone's personal story, similar to what we've heard today. It shed lights on things that we haven't considered. Skaters creatively navigate their city, and it's a marvel to witness them through the, their lens. Photo Voice allowed me to do this. So as we create an enjoyable city and address massive concepts like this, the skaters shared feelings of sentiments. Understanding their urban relationship allowed me to contextualize these concepts. And so I bring forward some photos today to show you how exciting it is to see how a photo and a story together can deepen our urban understanding. Skateboarding is healthy, it's outdoor, it's enjoyable. It creates strong bonds and unforgettable memories and life lessons. In this photo, the participant is sitting here with his friends after a skater organized freestyle event in the city. It was the best day of his life. Here, the participant is on a skateboard and onlookers here in Langley as they organized a Black Lives Matter event. Through this action, assumptions were debunked and they held out, hand out flowers to anyone that passed by. In this photo, the participant addressed a lot of the things that we look at in urban planning today, such as how rainy it is in this city, the lack of weather appropriate skate spaces. This participant was going through an extremely difficult time. He would go to underground parking lots and listen to his breath while he skateboarded. Skaters are DIY urbanists. They continue to be creative and innovative. They repurpose underused parts of the city and they create bonds together to mobilize plans. This picture here is taken at Britannia Tennis Courts. There was a bunch of leftover, unused construction materials, and the skaters rallied together to create a park. They later received consent to legitimize this DIY space. And this photo shows how a semi-permanent structure can be erected and create community. So yeah, so much was learned from my research, but more than that, I got to see the city through a skater's lens, and what a unique point of view. Who else can we engage in this way? Who's in the fringes that we can bring into the fold? Amazing, thank you all so much. I'd like to invite you to give a round of applause to all our presenters. Thank you because we also brought Mega Love and they've made so many stories and you people talk about all the time and I'm with Mega Phone and they've really changed my life. And Mega Love, I brought them out here today because it keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> And that's that's great. Thank you. So Thank much. you so much. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm going to move us along because we have so much going on today um, in, our, in our wrap up. But I just want to say, you know, you can see how much work goes into being brief and focused and creative and humorous and have so much heart. Um, so, what's not to love about this format? And I want to now invite someone else who is impossible not to love, and that is Bruno, uh, Bruno de Oliveri Jaime. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Who knows how to make an entrance. And Bruno is assistant professor, oh yeah, <laughs> and gives the greatest hugs. Um, assistant professor, University of Manitoba, and 
I, I want to say in, in response to this concept about shrinking imagination, the solution is to hire professors <laughs> to teach educators, like someone like Bruno, who is so creative, so warm, so, so caring. So thank you so much for being here and leading this process in the Community Mosaic for Horizons. Really thank you so much, my friend. Having you here. Thank you so much. Th no, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank the cat. Thank you, thank everybody, thank you everybody. Um, let's do some stretch, everybody gets up a little bit. Let's, everybody get up, let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's let us, our body know that we're gonna move to something else. Everybody breathe in, and uh, one more time, breathe in, and uh, shoulders up, touch your ears with your shoulders, uh, and relax. One more time, breathe in, and uh, touch your head, touch your shoulder, touch your elbow, touch your elbow, touch your wrist, your knee, and check, 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 check. Now we can move to something else. Thank you so much for, uh, again, thank you so much for, for inviting me to this absolutely and powerful event. Um, I felt included for the vegan uh, food. I felt included because it was very uh, artsy fartsy conference, and um, it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And thank you for everybody who contribute to uh, to your visions of uh, how to imagine a new horizon for community engaged research. So thank you so much for your time. My grandmother used to say that your time is the most precious gift that you can give to someone because your time is a, piece, a little piece of your life that you're never going to get back. So thank you so much for giving a little piece of your life to this project. I will cherish your time, I will honor your time, and I will never forget it. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there was, there was an interesting vibe, not just in the conference itself, but the whole city. I don't know but if, felt the, if you felt the same way, but wherever I went to, the, wor the, the word imagine, it kept following me. I was biking back home yesterday, and I, I bike uh, in front of by the, the art gallery. There's a huge banner that says imagine. All of the, the majority of the talks that I, uh, that I attended, it was about imagination. But was an imagination, uh, was a, a, the, the word imagine kept showing up, but as a verb, imagine in. And when Bell Hooks talk in her work about imagination as a verb, for her, it's important Imagine in as a verb because how, how am I supposed to transgress something if I cannot imagine what's the other side? What's going up to motivate me to cross the bridge if I cannot imagine what is in the other side? So imagination is very, very important. And, uh, and uh, uh, we did a mosaic and we did it together. And, um, so what you uh, seen here today is a work in progress. It starts, uh, the concept of, like, uh, mosaic, it's, it's a very old thing. I, I, I wish I had invented it, I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> so, like, I wasn't even born. Uh, and, uh, but the idea of using uh, mosaics as, as a research tool in, uh, in community engaged research, it's quite new and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be part of this revolution of developing these creative methodologies for research. So this mosaics, I didn't invent this, but is the art of creating images with assemblage of small, flat, roughly square pieces. Uh, I said roughly because I was kind of high when I was cutting this, so it's not very <laughs> square. <laughs> I tried to keep a straight line, but ooh, you keep like woo. So roughly square. <laughs> of any choosing materials of different colors. And in this case here, we use, we use canvas. Like just unstretch canvas. 
Once they square, the roughly square pieces were placed together, they create a unified whole. The earliest known examples of mosaic made of different materials were found at a temple in Abra, Mesopotamia. And our data are the second half of the third millennium BC. Mosaics have developed into popular, into popular art and are not limited to professional trained artists, so much so that we did it. While ancient mosaics tended to be architectural, the mosaics that we see today, we find them everywhere, Bank, uh, uh, banks, um, um, not banks, uh, benches, <laughs> park benches, I'm ESL. Um, fashion shows, everywhere, everywhere that we look, we see mosaics. And today here in the Horizons Conference, this mosaic not just challenged aesthetic standards, but also brought together people from different backgrounds, different worlds, different life experience, and mediate dialogue amongst those who, you, with open heart, jump, jump right into the co-construction of such work of art. The process of creating the mosaic perhaps moved you out of your comfort zone by inviting you to experiment and play with materials that, will, that may not be part of your daily life, brushes, paint. Such ex experimentations may at first have sparked anxiety, fear, shyness. I love sitting on the table and people are just like getting like, oh, can I paint my square now? They're like, oh, so shine. Um, but it's beautiful. I love that, that you watch that process, how it changed from being shy and uncomfortable to happy sense of peace, sense of belonging, uh, warm, empowerment, and most important, love, and lots of, of it. And it's the love that I talk about is the radical love from, from Bell Hooks. And, uh, and, and lots of love uh, because we collectively did it. Looking at this mosaic today that was co-constructed by all of you, one may argue that this piece is too chaotic or it doesn't follow any aesthetic standard. Therefore, it cannot be art. However, within the suprematist art movement, for instance, art can emerge as a meaning from a simple geometric organization of lines this line, this, li this line arrangement creates a shape that in turn creates a perceptual meaning that can be perceived and considered as art. From another perspective, in the same way Deleuze and Gattari uses the metaphor of a patchwork quilt as a gathering of disjoint elements, this mosaic is indeed a gathering of disjoint individual stories. Each symbol chosen by participants is a separate and unique element but the same symbols are here combined to form a whole, a collective message about power relations, diversity, social justice. Following a gestalt, gestaltic principle, this unified image depicts a human portrait, bell hooks, a visual effect presenting the viewer with more than one interpretation and different ways of seeing and perceiving it. That is, the overall picture determines collective interpretation rather than the net effect of the individual pieces. This is not to say that the individual pieces are irrelevant, not at all, because it's the weaving of the individual squares, the individual stories, your individual stories, that the whole is co-constructed. Similar to a rhizome, this mosaic has multiple entryways for analysis and the ability to grow in multiple directions. This mosaic defines traditional, linear, male Eurocentric expositions because it is a co-construction of a postmodern self-narrative. That is, rather than describing the self as a linear being evolving along a single narrative timeline, it describes the self as a collective identity just as the Leos and Gattari's patchwork quilt acknowledge the, acknowledging the disparate elements that combine to form what is experienced as a uniform, uh, unifying identity. So what's gonna happen next with this museum? This is a work in progress. It starts a few, um, just before I travel to, to Vancouver, we started this project at the Human Rights Museum in, in Winnipeg 
the highly problematic human rights museum in Winnipeg, I must say, uh, when we have a, 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 a gala evening and we had a hundred, uh, over 150 people coming in and join and listen to Brazilian music and food and drinks and we painted uh, some of the squares and then I took to Victoria, BC, a grade seven classroom, and they add more, and now we are here today. Uh, we add more, and then uh, uh, next week, we have an a event similar to this in Bangkok, so people are gonna keep adding to this, and then we're traveling to Brazil, and then when we come back to, to, to Canada, uh, we're gonna do uh, a closure where it is started. So there is a lot to do, there is a, this is a working process, and thank you so much for being part of this journey and this revolution that we call education. Thank you.